So let me begin. One, two, three. I think we may have one person missing. Let me just check. Yanis Kesten Kuna, there. Good to meet you. Yanis, manager AI and digital twins at Pricewater Coopers. And thank you for jumping in at the last minute. We appreciate that. Um, we have Kirsten Rolf. Kirsten? She's on. Ah, okay. She's joining us virtually. Very good. Okay. We'll see if we can get her. We'll get to come back to her in a moment. We've got George Ringer, professor of law and finance in the University of Hamburg. Welcome, Professor. Very good. We've got Julia Reinhardt, Senior Fellow of Stiftung Mercato at AI Campus Berlin. Welcome, Julia. And Felix Brossman, Director, Intelligent Automation at SCAD GmbH. Welcome, Felix. And let me see now. Ah, Kirsten Rolf, Partner Associate Director of BC Boston Consulting Group. Are you there, Kirsten? Can you hear us okay? No, not yet. Okay. We can see you. Hopefully, you can hear us soon. Okay? If you can, you can just give us a wave at some point. Okay. So, we have a few things to discuss here, and I want to get right to it. Um, the first question, I think especially for this group, everyone's been talking about the AI Act, the Artificial Intelligence Act. So, I'm going to open it to the panel. As we did last time, we're going to have two or three questions to the panels, and then we're going to open it up also, of course, for your Q&A. But my first question is simply this. Where do we stand in regards to the AI Act? What does it mean for AI innovators? Maybe I can just start to my left immediately with Felix. Yes, microphones there. You all have microphones too? Super. That is great. <clears throat> yeah, I think we are already above the tipping point, as uh, Dr. Sattelberger told us today, because as it is right now, there is lots of time that went into this act, and I think there are basic principles, we will talk about that, that are more or less settled, settled to the max. And uh, one thing of that is the so-called risk-based approach, which I, for myself, maybe reframe as a yeah, fear-based approach. More on that later on. Um, but I think we, we, we are over the point, we have to get over it, the AI act will come in one or another uh, perspective. But I will make one small test, please. Who of you, whom of you here in the room had already been in touch with the legislative uh, documents? Did anyone peek in and really looked at the documents at all? So I see um, one, well, about 10, about, about, 10. 10, yeah. about 10 people. Max, yeah. Let me tell you this. this that one isn't sufficient, and I will you explain why and what you, why you should do it right now, uh, this evening, take a look at it, and uh, why, <laughs> this is, why, why this is a matter of time. So Very good. With this, this, uh, with this cliffhanger. We call that a teaser in journalism. Teaser. Very good, a teaser, very good. Cliffhanger is also good. George, please, where do we yeah. stand in regards to the act? Thank you. I, I'll pick up that recommendation when I can't sleep tonight. I think that's a great <laughs> idea. Uh, where do we stand? Well, it's coming as we've heard, but I think one major point that maybe deserves some attention um, that we should think about is the problem what happens after it's there. And one of the problems, let me tell you that, I'm a law professor, so I can tell you that, <laughs> is the problem once we have a law in place, it's incredibly hard to change later on, mm. yeah, to update later on. Everybody in Brussels is saying, yes, it's future proof, and of course, right? But don't believe them. Uh, because it's already outdated now, we see this, you know, ChatGPT is there, and this whole thing, the body of it, was drafted prior to ChatGPT coming out, right? And they now hectically need to make some amendments, but I think the whole risk-based approach doesn't really sit easily mm. with, uh, you know, large language models and, you know, uh, general purpose AI and all those things. So, uh, hectically, they already need to update it. Luckily, it's still underway, right? But what happens once it's set in stone next year and then the next technology comes along in a year or two, or maybe even faster than that? So I think one of the big problems of legislation is that it's extremely rigid. Uh, and this is why I'm advocating for a much more flexible framework. We need mm. to have, and I've recently written about this, one thing that it could, could be useful in this context is a sandbox, uh, or you can call it differently, an experimentation space or something like that. You know, more flexible 
legal solutions that can be adjusted with speed, you know, with expertise. Don't put it through the European institutions that takes years uh, again to do it, but you know, you need to have new ways of regulation. That's sounds all like I want a, to start with. It sounds um, like a job for GPT, if I may say so. <laughs> yeah, um, uh, let's do it ourselves for now, <laughs> <Okay>. I think. <laughs> Very good. Kirsten, can you hear us now? I can. Okay, yes. wonderful. And Welcome. I can see you. <laughs> Excellent. I don't know if you Hello. heard. Hello. Did you hear a question? We, we just wanted to start off with a kickoff round. Where do we stand in regards to the AI Act, in your opinion? Yes. So I don't know if anyone knows, but um, I've, I've been a policymaker actually before I started with the Boston Consulting Group on April 1st. And I was responsible for, for the AI Act. Um, and I saw it basically on an ultrasound picture before the commission even proposed the very first draft oh, of it. Uh, okay. So I know it's come a long way, and I will say this, everything that is ready is being appreciated and being praised, and everything that's coming into being is underestimated. Mm. And I think that goes for the AI Act as well. I've yet to see, in my experience, like as a policymaker, a law that's perfect or rigid. That just doesn't exist. A law is only ever as rigid or perfect as, you, as the implementation of that. And we've seen that with GDPR, right? I mean, all the member states implemented it differently. I'm not saying that this is a good thing, but it's an opportunity. And I think that's the same with the AI Act. I think it's undoubted that at this stage in AI development, we need guardrails. Mm -hmm. I think it's also undoubted that the AI Act will be coming. I just sat together with Brando Benifei from the European Parliament only this week. And negotiation is underway. So I think any discussion that sort of, you know, is debating the whole setup of the AI Act by the, at this point is just, you know, not very, um, you know, not very productive. I think we will have to live with it the way it is, but we will need to learn how to be sort of also agile policymakers and use it to the best of our knowledge, but also see it as an opportunity and the necessary guardrails that we need for AI. Um, I think just a view of the AI Act as a, as a rigid law is not the right way to see it, but it's never the right way with any of the of the European laws. So mm -hmm. I think where do we stand with the AI Act? I think we have a, a solid set of guardrails. Are they perfect? No, definitely not. Would I have done an AI Act given the chance two years ago? Probably not. But given that we've come so far, I think we might as well now go through with it and then also um, define implementation as we go along. Great. Thank you very much. Yanis, you're up, please. Any thoughts on this? Yes. So when, when we're looking at a legislation, it's, it's always about societal discussion. I mean, I agree with it's, it's some kinds of le legislation that is driven by fear, but obviously we have the fear in society. I mean, I'm an AI enthusiast, but not uh, everyone is such a person. And so it is about getting acceptance uh, broad acceptance in society. And this is, on the one hand side, the attempt to setting rules to, to uh, at some point, regard these concerns of this AI technology. And it can also be a, a framework enabling AI markets. So providers of AI systems know about their obligations, know about requirements. Mm -hmm. So it, it could be a market enabler. It could be an accelerator of innovation, but looking at the EU AI Act now, I know we have this trilogue, and I cannot say on which side of the ends we are, mm. if it is like fear-driven or if it is enabling innovation. Mm. But we have both things in it. If we can pinpoint to this high-risk systems so that only, only these systems that really are high-risk, so in the eyes of, of of the broad society. If we really can narrow it down to these systems, it could be a very good thing, but we will see. We will see. Yeah, there's one quick follow-up. You said you're an AI enthusiast. And just in one sentence, why are you an AI enthusiast? I've heard that several times today in our meetings. <laughs> <laughs> yes, first of all, it is complex, and this, I'm curious about complex systems. Yeah. And then I'm very curious about about humans and psychology and neural nets try to imitate it. Not really good, but they mm. try at least. And it's, it's a complex system we do not understand, but we are impressed with what it can bring to the society. And with humans, it's the same. I cannot understand humans at all, but I'm <laughs> impressed what they can bring to society and sometimes cannot. So this is like 
like my my enthusiasm. Very good, very good, excellent. Thank you, Julia. Please, your yeah. thoughts on the AI Act? Yeah. Uh, so a lot of true true things have been said already on this uh, panel sure, uh, sure. in this first round. So uh, let me just add my uh, my specific perspective. Working at AI Campus Berlin, which is essentially a co-working space, uh, all for for AI-focused companies, uh, and it's the biggest of its kind in uh, in Europe. And uh, what I do there is that um, I'm 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 funded by Stiftung Mercator, which is a philanthropic foundation, um, I'm, and I'm focused on the societal impact of AI, and I'm hosted by those companies um, essentially really to, to bring that civil society perspective into their work on a daily basis. Mm -hmm. And so I, I, I bring a little bit of a different perspective there, but uh, that's essentially the point. Um, uh, small AI companies are very interested in uh, in how their work and their, their AI systems impact society, and want to, they want to impact it positively. And uh, so, being in touch with the arguments that I bring to the table is really important to them in an, in an early stage of their products. So that as a as a as an introduction. But um, I, I found it interesting that you right away jumped in with this. Um, with the uh, the critique that a risk-based approach is actually a fear-based approach, and I, I I agree that the that the name of this approach uh, it's not invented by the Commission, but it came about uh, just because they were essentially just focusing on the on the risks um, that some AI systems bring um, as a category, and uh, this is what they actually wanted to uh, regulate with this act. So the rest of AI uh, systems aren't regulated almost at all, um, so and some very few are pro prohibited. So it's actually a very light touch, I would say. Um, and um, and I would uh, I, in my daily work, I've started uh, calling the high risk category high impact or high responsibility category. And uh, what I mean by that is that uh, for me as a, and I look at it from a consumer, a citizen point of view, I want those uh, AI systems that actually uh, belong into that future high risk category to, to be made here in Europe um, and to, to be made under those uh, prescriptions and requirements that the, that the law um, plans for them because they are the most important uh, for us and they have the most impact uh, on our lives so they have to also do this under the highest responsibility and, and that's really important to me. So what I'm actually doing is encouraging uh, European companies to go into that high responsibility, high impact uh, space and to, to build AI systems in that area and not in areas that are actually uh, well, I mean, nice to have, but essentially irre irrelevant for our, for our lives. Very good. Thank you very much. Uh, as I said in the, in the morning session, if anyone wants to jump in, has a different feeling, this is a roundtable discussion, so you don't have to wait for me. Anyone want to say anything on this topic before we go to our next question? Then I'll jump right into it. Uh, you talked about this. The EU, the US, and China have all taken very different approaches to AI regulation. And this is just to anyone now on the panel. Do you feel that the European approach is at advantage, excuse me, is advantage for the AI economy? The European approach, we'll start there. Please, yes, and then we'll continue to George, go ahead. Since the microphone is still close to me. <laughs> um, yeah, so I've spent the last 10 years until last summer in California, and um, so what I can compare best is the American uh, slash Californian approach uh, <laughs> to uh, to regulation. So I've looked at the, I'm, I'm still looking at the at the federal level, but also at the U.S. state level, uh, which is very active. And then of course the European, which is that's my my home base um, and background. But um, so uh, coming from that um, perspective, I, I have to say that uh, California is the place that hosts most of the uh, AI um, co companies probably in the world. I'm not so quite sure about the well, statistics, so. but that's yeah. what it feels like. Um, and um, and 
they are very curious about the European pr approach. They have mm -hmm. been already in, uh, I was there when uh, GDPR uh, was introduced. I, um, I actually also have a policy making background, uh, not in the same institution as Kirsten, but I was in the foreign office. Um, and, and so um, when GDPR started to be negotiated, I, I moved to San Francisco to represent Germany there and uh, then moved into the data protection space. And so I've actually really followed closely the introduction of GDPR in California. And let me say, they, it was an interesting up and down of emotions. And uh, <laughs> let's say from very low and very frustrated to what the Europeans are doing there to, mm. ah, actually, this is interesting because it, it does uh, uh, create a level playing field on a very high level, mm. um, which is you know, for some hard to reach. But once you're on that level, it, it really makes things so much easier. And so in the privacy field, to compare that with the AI, um, we, uh, we've seen in, in the US a, a really chaotic uh, picture so far. We have uh, like every state uh, has already or is working on its own privacy law. And that is not what we understand and, uh, um, of an internal market. So having GDPR in, uh, for the entire EU, we can, this is not the place to criticize the implementation, mm -hmm. uh, is a huge deal. And I see that coming for the AI Act. Okay. I saw George, maybe you want to jump on something? Yeah. I mean, so I, I fully agree with you that the Americans are watching us. And uh, I just fear that they are watching us to see whether we make any mistakes uh, and, you know, be the second mover then uh, doing an upgraded, a uh, <laughs> little bit more <laughs> light touch approach of, of regulation. And, and Brussels obviously hopes for the Brussels effect, you know, hopes for a repeat of GDPR to be the world's, you know, standard setter. I fear that for a nascent technology that is not as easy to do as with data protection, which has been there for a long time, you know, something mm -hmm. that we can standardize and it bears the hallmark of consensus of 27, formerly 28 countries, great, yeah. But if you really want to promote a new technology and bring it to Europe, you know, that firms are growing here, then uh, it seems to me that erring on the side of caution can have very dangerous, very risky uh, consequences. So it's it's that, you know, you mentioned China as well. We don't probably need to talk a lot about China because I think the draft Chinese regulation says all the um, AI technology has to be in the socialist spirit or something like that. You know, mm -hmm. that, that gives them basically uh, a free reign to prohibit almost everything. Uh, so the, the race will be between Europe and the US, and the US is, I think, making a clever move of waiting just a little bit, letting its own tech companies grow, and then seeing what they can do uh, after after we make the first move. Super, Alex, think, Fe yeah. Oh, yeah, please, Kirsten, yeah. and then Felix, go ahead. Yeah, if I, may, if I may jump in. I think it really helps to have a bit of a, maybe more nuanced view of what, what you want to do as a company. If you want to implement, for instance, uh, some of these really valuable but basically table stakes use cases with Gen AI that we're seeing, basically, you know, use cases where you summarize a large amount of documents or process a lot of data with uh, tools that um, include generative AI, what you really are facing as a company is a huge complexity of how to implement them in an effective way and in a, in a way that, that's basically de-risking the implementation of those ready-made and pretty much table stakes use cases. And we will see more and more of them become table stakes use cases and really commodities in the next six months. And if that is what you want to do, then the AI Act is a pretty solid framework, both in terms of process development, as in, also in terms of governance, and in terms of a really good risk taxonomy that you can use to implement these use cases relatively easily. Mm -hmm. If, however, you want to build a large language model by yourself, but I will say I, I don't see many people wanting to do that right now, um, and we can discuss if this is a problem for Europe, but of course, right now, the fact is that we have some pretty strong large language models out there, um, and maybe there's no need to build another one. Um, you can argue with me on that, but if that's what you want to do, then of course European legislation is a burden. Um, I totally grant that. It, it will be difficult to, to catch up with the, the American innovators there. But I do think that it really needs a nuanced view of what you want to do with AI to judge then if the European framework is a good one or not. It really depends on your, your point of view mm -hmm. and where you're at in the implementation process. 
And that's the same, I'd say, with all the other legislative processes. Super. Thank you, Kirsten. Felix, please. I think the biggest advantage is that we are talking about legislation as the thing, especially in this AI community, in the startup community. We talk a little bit, but we pretty much deeply don't care. And let me prove that to you. Um, did anybody hear from you about the public consultation that actually right now, right at the moment, takes place to the AI Act? You hear about it. So there is a, there is a public consultation um, for the recommendations the EU Parliament is making. I think it closes by Friday. It closes by Friday and they are trying to build up more arguments against or, or for the, the things they are uh, talking about, um, I think the, uh, there, there are two phases. So you could, right now, as a citizen, give your voice a little, a little chance of being heard by the policymakers, albeit we have to admit it is a trilogue. So there will be not too much change about that, what is already settled in. So don't be over-optimistic. <laughs> Uh, on the on the things you, you propose there, but there's still there, there is a chance and actually uh, yesterday evening I wrote with an MEP and asked how how well is it working? What's the feedback out of the community? So normally they have between 100 and 200 feedbacks they they are gathering at the state of I think 9 o'clock p.m. last evening it was 20 mm. So take that with the first question I asked to you, whether somebody looked into it or not, I don't think we are taking the whole discussion too seriously as a community, as an AI community, and especially, especially for startups. And why I'm mentioning this, um, we at SCAT are not only doing consulting business, because for consulting business, there are great times. You have new legislation. You can make money for selling new frameworks for helping your customers. That's a pretty, pretty great time. But we are also developers of AI systems. <laughs> and in that role, you can believe me, especially as a firm uh, founded in 2017, we are pretty, pretty have heavy sweats. <laughs> <laughs> and we are, we are really thinking on how we can do this lawfully, rightfully, with all the AI Act rules are upcoming. And we have another perspective, and I think that's the most critical, at least for me, we are also investors. We have small investments pre-pre-seed, <laughs> as Dr. Sattelberg had mentioned. And when I'm talking with those startups, AI startups, they have absolutely no clue what is coming up to them and what this means for their product, for their development, but they had, have to act now. Also startups have to act now. Oh, very good. Janis. Yeah, if, word. if we come back to this comparison between US and uh, Europe, it's it's a culture thing again. It, it's it's that do you do you focus on individual responsibility to to create systems that aren't harmful and are willing to to pay the price if you don't, or do you want to have a a societal discussion for before upfront? And then have a, a legal framework about it. And this is this is just do you do you focus on do on not go doing wrong steps, or do you focus on doing the right steps? Mm. And a little bit, it's in America, we, we are looking at the opportunities of this new technology, and we are looking at the downsides of it. And both is important, um, but yes, it, it reflects on legislation in this case. Mm. George, you just, a, just a quick word on what uh, Felix said earlier. I, I, I think that's absolutely right. Uh, startups will have a big problem with this new regulation, and there will be a difference between startups and the big ones, right? So last week, I don't know if people know this, uh, Thierry Breton, the European commissioner, was in the Silicon Valley and was talking to, you know, NVIDIA and OpenAI, and they're all happy, and they are sure we comply with the AI Act, no problem, we're super interested, we will collaborate. For them, that's a piece of cake, right? And, and of course they will do that. Uh, but it's about the small startups that face, you know, a jungle of, of new uh, regulations. That's the problem. Uh, and I think yeah. this difference is something that uh, is, is coming. I think that's a good segue to my next question. Before I do that, though, do we have some questions from the audience? Can I see hands up so I can get a feel for it? One, two, 
Good. So we have three or four questions. So let me do one more question from my side, and then we'll take the microphone to our audience. To entrepreneur startups, let's say in the beautiful city of Berlin, it sounds, expensive, it sounds very expensive to comply to all of this new AI regulation. In balance, generative AI, you create it, but who really owns it? Does anyone know? I don't know the answer to that. Does anyone know the answer to it? Who owns this new generative AI? Hmm. Anyone in the audience? That's a good, good legal question. A good uh, legal question? Okay. Uh, <laughs> good. Uh, well, well my, my hunch would be the creator owns it, but of course they can sell it, they can license it. Mm -hmm. I mean, there are lots of um, lawyers are creative, right, in, in uh, creating arrangements that suits them. So um, there's always obviously a big discussion on, you know, yeah. uh, producers versus users and, you know, how far does responsibility allocate between them. If, if, that's, if that's your point, then, of yeah. course, is a question, can the producer, the developer, basically completely shield off the responsibility by giving it over to the user and say, you know, you use it, I have nothing to do with it anymore. And that's probably uh, not how it's going to work out. Okay, Felix? If I may jump in there. Um, actually, there were pretty great changes made from the original proposal to the council's version, now to the parliament's version. Mm -hmm. And in the last version, if you take a deep look in there, and that's why I say it was fear-driven, um, you recognize some patterns. So first pattern is they are very aware that there's jet GPT out there. <laughs> Wasn't there in the two drafts before them. So actually there are lots of lots of lots of rules and uh, things that they are trying with a hot needle to stick in, at least my impression. And uh, you see, because there are some spelling mistakes. That <laughs> um, okay, another topic. But um, if you, <laughs> if you uh, are looking into the rules, and for that we have to be fair with the European Union. There are some measurements taken to uh, yeah, make it a little bit lighter for small and medium-sized enterprises to get over the AI Act. So at first, I think it is a pretty clear sense that this open source mm. will, will have a lot easier time before the market entry. Beforehand, it was pretty unclear territory, so that's, a, that's the first thing. The another, another thing is, and I think that isn't talked about at all, is that you can try to opt out to the risk, to the high risk, uh, um, um, yeah, standardization. Th th there is a mechanism in there, so they thought about maybe it isn't all the high, uh, the high risk or not. Whether it works or not, I have my doubts too. So, um, and there are there are several other me measure measurements um, that are looking, that are looking as if they are proceeding in the right directions. Mm -hmm. But, but <laughs> nevertheless, when you are trying as a small company or as a startup to get your product at the market, and that's the very, the very uh, most important point, going through the market, then you more or less have to fulfill all the requirements besides the uh, uh, regular, re regulatory advantages you get beforehand. So that's, um, that's a bummer. Mm. So, so this is this is one of the points where regulation can be an enabler as well. For if you do not know who owns the system, especially as a startup, you cannot take the risk. You do not know if, if you are responsible for it. And if you have a regulation on it, you have certainty about it. And maybe you can have a certification about it so that you aren't liable anymore. The certification authority is, but this, this may, might be expensive. But it's, it's a price, you know how high it is, and this is more, more certain. So this is a point where it can be an enabler as well. One final word, and then we'll open up to Q&A from the audience. Yeah, I, I just wanted to add uh, to um, what we, so this perspective that we're having that regulation is a risk and that uh, we should wait with regulation until our industry is maybe strong enough, or I mean, I'm summarizing, but uh, I just want to draw the attention to the fact that we already have um, failures of AI systems impacting people negatively all throughout the world and also in Europe. So we've had a couple of uh, big scandals already where uh, not intentionally, of course, I'm not absolutely not saying that, but for, uh, because somebody made a mistake uh, building the algorithms or didn't predict what would actually happen or implemented the system maybe in a naive way or too fast, uh, not waiting until a certain quality was, uh, was achieved through testing, uh, we did have people um, negatively impacted uh, financially, but also even like worse than that. Mm -hmm. And um, and so 
Waiting for regulation, I think at this point, uh, I don't know what we want to wait for because uh, we, I mean, as much as I, I want these applications to see the world and to, to help us with many things, especially in the high responsibility uh, field, I want them to work well. And that's actually my point. I want to uh, like, uh, push the AI builders to, to, to uh, create quality systems. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Great. Good. It's time then for our questions and answers. Questions, please try to keep them short. And on the answers, everyone doesn't have to answer, just one or two panelists if they wish. So we'll start off. Please, sir. So as a user here in Europe, um, how will I be affected by the implementation of this law? Like, um, will my chat GPT be less powerful than the, from the users in the US? And uh, for smaller, for I service from smaller companies, will I not be able to access them? Will I have to use an, uh, like a VPN, or how will it affect me? Super. Thank you. The first question is whether you as a user will be able to use a lot of stuff, you know, if it's not developed in the first place, or whether some uh, companies are moving out or not serving Europe anymore. That's the, that's the first big question. Right? If, if they see the regulatory regime as too, too harsh. Uh, and the AI Act also does a number of things, a number of big obligations on users uh, you know, to comply with instructions and do good training and transparency stuff. So that's OK, right? But I think the, the key question is more on the developing stage, um, not, not so much on, on the user stage. Great. Yes, please go ahead. And Kirsten, in case you also want to answer something, just raise your hand so we can see you, because digitally it's tough to read if you want to answer that, OK? Can you hear me, Kirsten? In case you want to answer in the Q&A sessions, just raise your hand. Hopefully she can still hear us. Please go ahead. And I would add also that, uh, so the, the labeling, the transparency side, I think would be most important as a, so <laughs> it's, it's confusing because the act uh, speaks of users, but that's actually not you and me, but that's people, or like companies who uh, deploy um, AI systems. But so as a, as a citizen, I think what's most, what will be most, most visible is that you will have to be alerted in what way whatsoever we will have to see how that technically works when AI is, um, uh, is used for anything and uh, in, in, the, in the high risk category. So uh, I think that will make uh, choices easier and that will also make uh, you uh, more confident in, in, in using certain AI systems because you know where they are actually deployed or not. Yanis, one word. And the next question, do I have Hans here? Just so I know. Okay, I'll make one in the back. Yanis, please, go ahead. Thanks. Um, for AI system creators, it's always um, oftenly about functionality. So maybe you won't see that, that fast lots of functionalities, but you add requirements to it, and they should, should enhance the product. So like interpretability, explainability, we heard it in the talk before. Like, like biases, we want to have a check that there's no bias in it. So maybe you see less products, but you see better products. And products are not only about functionality. They are about security, safety, autonomy and control, and so on and so on. And so maybe you see more mature systems. Super. We have a question here, please. Thank you. So um, I developed code for automotive and aviation systems, which are considered safety critical systems. So my question for you is, do you know why they're using such strong words like unacceptable risk or risk for the systems describing algorithms rather than the applications? Yeah, this is my question. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Mm. Um, yeah, so that's a, a linguistic question you're asking. So, so why are they describing the algorithm as the risk rather than the outcome? Is that we're asking? Um, does it make a big does it make a big difference? I'm Please asking, uh, yes, or yes. is it just a political tool to say you know maybe it's easier to sell? I mean, I'm just second guessing here. I don't know the answer. Yeah, for mm. for me, it makes a difference because I see, for example, these algorithms, like these biometric algorithms, they have really good applications which ease our lives. And I think they are classified as unacceptable risks at the moment. Mm -hmm. So this is my my question, where this is coming from. So, so when we look at Trilog, um, some of, of them are saying the same thing. It's the risk comes through the application, not through the algorithm technology or so. And if we have a risk-based approach, we can always and 
only go through use cases and applications for how do you want to quantify impact or uh, probability of entry. Uh, you just only can do it if you know what happens. If the thing that happens is that a glass falls down, this is not the high impact. And so we have to be very clear that we go through use cases, in my opinion, and not through technologies. We have a question here. So I have a question. My name is Peter Krell from AI Mac, a new publication from Germany about AI. Um, I, I sense there is a fear among um, non-technical, know-how-verse people um, who are basically in positions of power and who are making decisions about technical issues, right? So maybe that's a, a bottleneck problem that we are uh, facing. And if you want to have transparency, then we should have started with the uh, Intel chips with the protected mode from day one, right? And we don't have open hardware, so why start now? I, does it make sense to regulate the this, this space that we need innovation, right? <clears throat> mm -hmm. So maybe one kind of an answer could be Skynet to to you, because uh, I think that that <laughs> thanks a lot. I appreciate that one, um, <laughs> b because I think uh, in the heads of the policymakers, Skynet is uh, the end. Yeah, the end boss, so to say. And um, they're heavily, heavily, heavily trying to protect us and the society for getting there. So, um, and, the, and, and, and there are some things that really also are making me afraid. So if you look at Agent GPT and you take a look in the future and um, you, you, you are a little bit creative. What can we do uh, if you have malicious thoughts in your mind? Um, you can get really, really, really bad scenarios there. Um, but nevertheless, I think in the European Union there is a pretty well-settled thought that um, you could regulate so that you have a, 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 a watermark CE and that is put on AI, and so it is trustworthy. And I think that's the overarching theme and the hope that arises with all the regulational approaches, whether they suit or not. And maybe, just maybe, they aren't too far off the truth right there, because at least in my consultancy practice, I recognize a lot of, yeah, mistrust to AI. So. Maybe if we look at the bright side of things that really could foster innovation um, in regards of, yeah, there is a certificate of trust and now I'm going to use it and now I'm more open-minded. Mm -hmm. That's it. <laughs> okay. okay. Kirsten just wanted a technical check. Can you hear us okay, Kirsten? Yes, and I just wanted to add on that question please, please. that, uh, if I may, that research institutions, institutions are accepted from the AI Act. So research is still going to happen at universities, etc. It's not, it's not that innovation isn't possible anymore. It just has guardrails. Um, and is explicitly research at university, scientific research is accepted from the AI Act. Super. Thank you. On this side of the room, we have time for two or three more questions. The gentleman in the back, any other questions real quick? I'll make my tears one, and the young lady in the corner there maybe will be the final one then. Please, sir, go ahead. Hi there. Really interesting uh, conversation here. Um, what I'm wondering, and tying into everything that's been said so far, Gutenberg, Zeiss, Benz, right? Werner von Braun, if you will, with his rockets. I mean, like, Germany has been a powerhouse. What's happened in the last 50 years? SAP and Wirecard. We have regulated ourselves out of relevance. And I'm, I'm really afraid, even if it's research institutions and you kind of have the deep tech scene, it's not economically relevant. So here's a, a challenge I'd like to put to you. Even if we said, you know, we're going to support um, young companies, we're going to remove kind of the administrative burden, the costs of them founding these, uh, kind of building things around AI, GDPR, how are we going to train those models? We can't access the data. So like, if, it, it, also from like a legal perspective, is, is there some way that it would be really interesting to me. Is there some way that even if this, this, this AI act didn't come, uh, or was, wasn't passed, that, that we could build relevant companies? Great. Thank you very much. Yeah, thanks. Super good comment. Um, where, where is Germany heading? We, we somehow missed the train, right? And uh, it's interesting to see that 
coming back to the point we made earlier, we are the world champion when it comes to regulating, uh, but we're not the world champion when it comes to developing new technologies. And I think um, the other thing that we haven't mentioned yet is that there's also a little bit of a flavor of protectionism, right? So we're seeing we're not the world leader in the, those new technologies, so we're trying to catch up and to be the first to, to restrict them uh, in the hope that this will impress the others, I'm, I'm not so sure, right? So the focus is, I mean, that's what you're implying, is that we should put a much stronger emphasis on developing technology, on training IT people. You know, this is where the, the focus should be to build up a new generation of inventors in Germany. I think we might not be the best in innovation and technology, but we are still good. But we are gotten bad in producing products out of it. I mean, as innovator, you can just, just play around. This is no problem. But if you do want to have a product, there are entry barriers where you look at. This is the problem. So as, as someone who wants to build a company, often you have to, to move ashore. And this is a great problem, yeah. I'd, yeah, I just wanted to add to that. So uh, exactly, I think um, we do have all those university researchers who are doing an amazing job also in this field. And it's actually the go-to market and product um, uh, that um, design that's the problem and i i mean i i've, I've lived in the uh, in the us for so long i we have this like german community in silicon valley san francisco all those people who not because uh, regulation was uh, is is not only because of that that's uh, really important i think but because this this link between research and and uh, industry is so so much tighter there. That's what drew them there, and that's why they they like building products there because they can um, go directly from university to uh, to a company and and co um, and create uh, interesting innovation there. Um, yeah. So, and I also uh, really think that uh, we're not doing ourselves a favor by always belittling our industry. Um, uh, GDPR and the AI Act have some overlap, of course, but uh, think of the fact that GDPR only uh, targets personal data, and uh, mm -hmm. training da uh, training data for AI is so much more than personal data. So, uh, don't be too worried about that. Um, I, I, there's amazing talent in, in Germany, and I can say from the AI campus in Berlin, but I know the same is true for, for Hamburg, um, that, um, yeah, there's definitely potential, but maybe 10, 15 years ago, there were ma mistakes made on both sides of the Atlantic in antitrust. So we do have uh, tech giants now, um, which was not intended this way, and I think it's a bit of a failure of the system too. Um, and now it's difficult to compete against them, and that's absolutely true. It's a huge problem, but I think it's uh, it's because on both sides of the Atlantic there were mistakes made in antitrust competition policy. Super. Very short. Just number. to add, and just to maybe add yes, on please. Julia's point, yes, sure. let, let, let me remind everyone of BioNTech. Um, just recently, uh, innovation from Germany that basically saved millions of lives around the world in, during the COVID-19 pandemic, and that was an innovation from Germany. And then the second innovation I'd like to mention, maybe closer to AI, is extreme ultraviolet um, technology that uh, gives chips of today, like actually makes them smaller and makes them more energy efficient. And it, it's, a, it's an innovation by Zeiss, also a German company, and it essentially broke Moore's law, which um, was meant to be unbreakable before, the sort of the law that makes, that says that chips, you know, computing power um, doubles every 18 months, I think. Um, so I think there's still innovation in, in Germany and Europe. I think it's just not as visible because it's not Facebook and, and maybe B2C, um, but only um, I think on Wednesday, the Data Act was passed um, in the European Union that was meant to free up industrial data and data sharing. So I wouldn't be as pessimistic here. And uh, to Julia's point, I really think we shouldn't belittle our, our um, innovations and what we've done um, recently um, in the world just because we didn't invent Facebook. Fantastic. F final word to Felix, please. <laughs> just, just, just one quick uh, consulting tip without a fee for you. <laughs> just, just get get uh, this evening uh, get the text of the act and uh, just search for sandbox. There you will find some regulatory approaches on how you could use 
um, compliant data, etc. PP and <laughs> I, I see we have to we have to fulfill this. Yeah, yeah, okay. Um, there are there there are things that will occur, but I don't think that it will help you too broadly in the short time. That's the bad news at this time. Professor, so the, the final word. The is a nice nice attend, but I think it's more of a marketing gimmick. To be quite honest, it's a it's a nice <laughs> thing. Yeah, we are open to innovation, but. I'm, I'm remain quite skeptical, unfortunately, on that. We, we have to speak about this again. Fair enough. Felix, George, Janis, Julia, and Kirsten, thank you very much for our panelists' discussion today. Great job. Great job. <laughs>